Hi, I'm Carl, and uh, today I have some very interesting artifacts that came from the Project Rover uh, operation that was done at Los Alamos between about 1955 and 1969 under the direction of Dr. Raymer Schreiber. Uh, Schreiber had been a, a Manhattan Project physicist working on nuclear weapons. Um, he had been a farm boy, grew up working on tractors, uh, then got into nuclear physics. And his career took him some very interesting places, uh, ultimately into this futuristic project to build nuclear-propelled rockets. And uh, the Los Alamos Laboratory did some of the initial work on, on these rocket engines at Los Alamos, and later they actually built prototypes which were tested out at the Nevada test site. And I have the enormous privilege of um, having access to some pieces of the Project Rover uh, nuclear fuel mock-ups that were made as part of these projects uh, courtesy of Ben Saunders who is Raymer Schreiber's grandson. And also I acquired a few of these specimens on my own. And basically what these engines were is they were open Brayton cycle hydrogen cooled reactors that relied on highly enriched uranium so you had the highest energy density possible and the fuel was a refractory mixture of graphite and initially uranium oxide and later uh, uranium carbide. And they had some real problems with the technological development um, in that the hydrogen is very corrosive at high temperatures and so they had to figure out how to plate these reactor components so that they would not erode in the, um, in the, uh, in the reactor uh, test program. So, the very earliest fuel is exemplified by this little guy here. It has four channels and it's, it's a round extrusion and hydrogen flows through these channels, absorbs heat from the nuclear reaction and uh, that hot hydrogen is then expanded through a, uh, through a nozzle to produce thrust and that's how the earliest of these reactors work. This is typical of um, the uh, Kiwi A prime test. Uh, this was their first real uh, powered test out at Nevada. Kiwi, of course, is, is a bit of a pun because it's the flightless bird. Um, and uh, this was intended to be a stationary test just to make sure that the reactor was working properly and that the technology was capable of producing thrust in just a static test. Um, this worked very well. Um, they moved to other cylindrical uh, fuel elements. This is typical of sort of the second generation or the B series of the Kiwi program. We're talking about uh, sort of late 1950s here. Finally, the ultimate uh, solution that they settled on was this 19-hole hexagonal uh, fuel element. And again, this material would have been made out of uranium carbide in graphite. They settled on this for uh, in the Kiwi 4 uh, or the B4A test. And then later on, um, this was used in the Phoebus test, which were the highest power densities ever achieved in nuclear reactors. So this is, uh, this is what they ended up with. They did some additional uh, tests with these more complex extruded forms. I believe this is uh, 37 uh, holes in this element. This became too complicated and they had trouble with the dyes and so forth. Um, so they mostly stuck with, with 37 element hexagonal fuel and they would cluster this fuel in uh, arrangements around holding pins and here's a piece that exemplifies the array of uh, fuel elements into a cluster. It's been uh, nickel plated for, I guess, display purposes. But uh, if you look in the back, you can see this is also just a graphite extrusion that has had the uh, holes put in it. Um, this is, of course, the fuel would have been in separate elements that were arrayed in the cluster. And, and this piece is just made for, for demonstration. Um, Here's another one. This shows a, uh, a little keyway to align the uh, center gas tube within these elements. And we have one of these gas tubes here. This is a re-entrant design that allows gaseous hydrogen to cool the support structure. And then the, the gas comes in to the end, 
uh, reservoir here and then passes back out and provides cooling all along the length of this so that the extreme temperatures encountered don't destroy the, uh, the uh, structural components that hold this together. Uh, this is another test item that would have held fuel elements and we're talking about sort of mid-1960s here. This is the the last of the Kiwi and, and then the Phoebus uh, nuclear rocket engine components. Um, this is made out of aluminum so we know it's not intended to be used nor of course was it ever used in a nuclear rocket engine. Um, it was intended as a uh, just a mock-up, a test article. Um, so these are uh, I also have a few components that I think were probably related to the extrusion process. Uh, this has been nickel plated so it's a display piece but I think this was likely uh, a model of the uh, coating tube that was used to put carbide coatings on the uh, insides of the fuel channels in order to make them impervious to hydrogen. As I mentioned earlier hydrogen is corrosive at the temperatures encountered and so they had to figure out a way of producing a carbide coating that would uh, be resistant for the life of the rocket engine. So a lot of people think, well, nuclear rocket engines, that's a very futuristic idea. We didn't come anywhere close to having these technologies develop. And the actual matter of fact is that this technology achieved a very high level of readiness. And the only reason that NASA did not go ahead and use these rocket engines is because momentum for the program sort of ran out as the Cold War dialed back. Uh, President Kennedy could be said to be sort of the, the apex of, uh, or the zenith, if you will, of, of nuclear uh, rocketry research because of the strong support at that time for the space program. And then since then, it sort of dwindled down. And while this technology is essentially ready to go, um, it never had the opportunity to fly. And maybe in our lifetimes that will happen. I have a Geiger counter out here because to my great amusement um, a couple of these items are in fact detectably radioactive and so I'll turn the Geiger counter on and of course there's always background radiation so the Geiger counter is making a few little clicks I'll turn it around to face the camera and um, we can look at this uh, make sure there's not any dust in it we can look and see that we do have a few counts. We're on the times one scale, so whatever it says on counts per minute here uh, is what we have. And to my eye, it looks like we're somewhere way down in the range of uh, like uh, 100 counts per minute, which is typical background for our altitude in Albuquerque. Uh, the first piece I found that was radioactive is this uh, piece of four channel fuel from the earliest tests. This is the Kiwi A prime material, um, and there it goes. I'm going to kick this down to a lower scale. So now we're looking at something like 200 counts per minute. I'll take this away. But let's take a look again. So we're getting about twice background in alpha and beta counts off of this little piece of mock-up fuel. Now obviously if this were the real fuel, you would have highly enriched uranium carbide in there and it would be very radioactive. Uh, this is not that, but it's still radioactive. So it makes sense to ask, well, why is this little mock-up piece of fuel actually detectively radioactive and what can we learn from it? So I'm going to take this item uh, into my guest bedroom slash uh, nuclear counting laboratory and we're going to take a closer look and see if we can actually get a, um, a gamma ray signature that's sort of like a fingerprint for what isotope is actually 
within this little piece of mock-up fuel that's causing it to be radioactive. Now, among these samples that I picked up uh, myself, uh, the uh, 19 element pieces here are also slightly radioactive and uh, so we're also interested in these guys uh, for the same reason. They seem to have picked up some radioactivity somewhere in perhaps their storage or their manufacture that may be related to their original, uh, to the rest of the program that would have produced these fuel elements. So let's just take this one for the moment. We're going to go down into the, uh, the uh, guest bedroom and uh, look at this on a germanium detector. Um, let's take a look at this apparatus real quick. We have a, uh, let's see, uh, oops, there we go. Pippin, do you want to hold the flashlight sure. for us? Cool, okay. So we'll move the camera back here to actually, uh, to take a look at the, the apparatus we've got. We have a seven and a half liter doer, which actually we need to refill, but there's liquid nitrogen in there. and it is keeping the germanium detector cold. And the germanium detector itself is down in the bottom uh, and we have uh, our signal cable and power cable and so forth for the germanium detector. And then the detector itself, erg, ah, lead is heavy. Uh, let's see, Pippin, if you could put the light down in there so we can actually see back into the working end of this thing. Uh, so this little cylinder back here, this is the germanium detector. I have a check source in here, it's cobalt 60, it's so I can uh, basically calibrate the energy uh, of the spectrometer. And then we have uh, a, a layer of tin and a layer of copper to line the cavity. And what these do is they actually cut down on lead x-rays that come from uh, what, we're, uh, what we're measuring. Um, so I've, I have this cobalt 60 source in there just to calibrate the spectrometer. I'm going to take it out and put it away. And we've got our specimen in here. And a little piece of foam for it to sit on. So we're going to place our specimen as close as we can right up next to that germanium detector to get the best measurement of this very low activity and that looks good to me. Um, we'll zoom in and show its position there. So I'm going to close up the cavity. Arrgh! There's about half a ton of lead in here um, to provide shielding. Um, so let's look at the, uh, the germanium detector signal. We have an oscilloscope over here. Yeah, you can turn it off. Just click it. There you go. So we have an oscilloscope and we're producing little pulses. And if you come on in close, you can see what these little pulses are. These are just like the pulses you get in a Geiger counter. They're little clicks, if you will, um, that uh, are demonstrating that the germanium detector is actually uh, receiving radiation and it makes pulses of charge when the radiation goes into it. So if we want to look at the spectrum of that radiation or the energy of that radiation, we have to disconnect the oscilloscope and connect a multi-channel analyzer. And what this does is it sorts the pulses into a histogram from low energy to high energy. Here is such a histogram for cobalt 60 on the computer screen. You can see it has two major gamma ray energies. One's at 1157 keV, one's at 1333. We're going to be looking to see what has contaminated our little piece of rover fuel and use this as a fingerprint, as I mentioned before, to try to identify the isotope or isotopes that are in it. Um, before we get started on this, uh, the, it's going to count for a long time, probably a day or so, 
um, and we need to refill the liquid nitrogen in the uh, detector doer. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. So I'm going to give my experiment a name. We're going to call this Rover 4. I'm going to set a live time of uh, 50,000 seconds. And I'm going to hit clear and start. And one, one thing you'll notice is immediately, immediately, we have a peak in this spectrum. And that peak happens to coincide with an energy that is well known from uranium and specifically from the nuclide uranium-235. And U-235 is um, part of natural uranium, but it's a small part of natural uranium. Most natural uranium is uh, a mixture of uh, U-235 and U-238 and U-234. And most of the activity is U-238 and its decay progeny, protactinium-234m, and uh, thorium-234 and so forth. But what we're seeing right here, if we were to see a protactinium peak, it would be out here. And there is none. There is no protactinium to be seen here. Uh, instead, we see only uranium-235. And so my conclusion so far, just based on this few seconds of counting, is that what we're actually looking at here is, in fact, highly enriched uranium that is contaminating this piece of rover fuel, probably because the mock-up fuel piece was passed through the same dye that was used to make the real fuel. And so what we have is an actual tangible link to the original laboratory that made this nuclear reactor fuel, which we're able to identify because of the gamma spectrum that's being produced by that small amount of radioactive material left on the stuff. So this is one of the things I love about uh, nuclear archaeology, you might call it. You can actually identify traces of these just fantastic science projects from times past, whether it's the Manhattan Project, whether it's the Chicago Pile. Uh, here we have the uh, early Kiwi reactor at uh, part of Project Rover. Uh, you can identify and really uh, get the sense that, that that history is present when these little ghost-like signatures in the radiation tell you something about where that piece came from and what happened with it. So it may just look like you know a, a random graph or something, but but to me this is this is really speaking volumes about what happened with this piece, and it's just a glorious thing to have this capability and to be able to do this and identify uh, that sort of hidden historical connection. Um, so, again, uranium-235 contaminating a piece of Kiwi 4A uh, mock-up nuclear fuel from the Raymer Schreiber collection. So, we're going to let this run. 50,000 seconds means it'll be done tomorrow, and uh, we should have a good, uh, good counting statistics. So, we'll know what the energy uh, is. Obviously, we'll know that quite well but we'll also know if there's any counts due to U-238 uh, or if there's any other contamination that's at a very low level that we just can't discern yet. But one thing's already apparent, uranium-235, highly enriched uranium, is in there. If there were more of it, it would be called, you know, weapons uranium, uh, and it's licensable material, but we just have a trace, so legally I don't think there's any concern. It's just interesting history here. So. Thank you for joining me in my home, and uh, I appreciate the interest that people have had in my various YouTube projects. Um, I hope this one's also interesting and that nuclear aficionados will get to see sort of a window into a pivotal technology that may one day power our deep space missions. And uh, we have Raymer Schreiber to thank for that way back in the 50s and 60s. It's still cutting edge, it's still waiting and uh, we'll just have to see if that technology ultimately takes us places within my lifetime.